Madam President. Senator from Alaska. Madam President, uh, during the Memorial Day recess, we received two pieces of alarming news that should inform the work of, of every member within this chamber. First, we learned that the national debt has surpassed $13 trillion in total. And then shortly after that, we learned that nearly all the jobs uh, that were added in May came from temporary census positions. The private sector created just 41,000 jobs last month, many fewer than expected, and certainly a far cry from the pace that will allow us to dig out from underneath this economic recession. Now, I think we all recognize that there's no question that our recovery is still fragile, very much in doubt, and it's also quite clear that it will take some time for millions of unemployed Americans to find their jobs, get back on their feet again. And these tough facts should encourage us to focus, to focus on these policies that create jobs, that reduce our debt, and at the same time, should encourage us to guard against policies that fail in either or both of those areas. Well, Madam President, we are here today to debate a policy that works against both of those goals. The Environmental Protection Agency's effort to impose economy-wide climate regulations under the Clean Air Act. The sweeping powers being pursued by the EPA are the worst possible option for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And there is broad bipartisan agreement that this approach would forego all of the benefits, all of the protections that are possible through legislation. It would reduce emissions at an unreasonably high cost and through an unnecessarily bureaucratic process. It would amount to an unprecedented, an unprecedented power grab, ceding Congress's responsibilities to unelected bureaucrats and move a very, very important debate, a critical debate, from our open halls to behind an agency's closed doors. Madam President, this approach should have been, could have been, taken off the table long ago. And yet, because the EPA is determined to move forward aggressively, and because neither Congress nor the administration has acted to stop them, it's now in the process of becoming our nation's de facto energy and climate policy. Because this is our worst option to reduce emissions, and Congress needs time to develop a, a more appropriate solution, I have introduced a resolution of disapproval. I introduced this back in January to halt the EPA's regulations. Now, my resolution does not affect the science behind the endangerment finding, but it will prevent the finding from being enforced through economy-wide regulations. Forty other senators, 40 other senators here in this body have joined me and are co-sponsors of this effort. Our resolution has garnered significant support among the American people. And from the day that it was introduced, we have in, we've had individuals, we have had groups and organizations from all across the country that have expressed their support and their appreciation. It really is a, a tremendous coalition, a significant coalition, from farmers and manufacturers to small business owners to, to fish processors. Um, there are more than 530 stakeholder groups that have endorsed our resolution's passage. And uh, I, 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 will, I will tell you, when we, when we look at some of those groups, you would not put them in a, in a category where you'd say, well, this is an entity that is standing up to, to fight, to push back against the, the EPA. Um, but Madam President, I will suggest to you that the broad range, the broad range of stakeholders is, is really a quite uh, impressive. Now, despite that support, I will still be the first to admit here that, that we face an, an uphill battle with this. We oppose the EPA's regulations because of their costs, most definitely. But unfortunately, that seems to be precisely why some senators 
have gone out front to support them, hoping that these economic costs will be so onerous that it will force us here in the Congress, here in the Senate, to adopt legislation that we otherwise wouldn't move to do. And this has been a, 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 an interesting, a sometimes difficult and, and contentious um, several months as, as we have moved forward with this resolution of disapproval. Personal attacks have been directed at supporters of this resolution in an effort, I think, to, to intimidate others from adding their names. Um, the, uh, the EPA administrator has somewhat incredibly suggested that our resolution was somehow related to the oil spill that is ongoing in, in the Gulf. Some have even claimed that the resolution is a bailout for the oil companies and are trying to make sure that we don't let another crisis go to waste uh, in other individuals' terms in their efforts uh, to pass sweeping cap-and-trade measures. Madam President, I would suggest that the only similarity that I see between the spill in the Gulf of Mexico and the EPA's regulations is that both of these, both of these are unmitigated disasters. One is happening now. The other one is waiting in the wings if Congress fails to adopt this resolution. This, uh, this decision, where we are today here in the Senate debating this resolution uh, of disapproval, ultimately boils down to, to four substantive factors. The first one is the inappropriateness of the Clean Air Act for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The second is the likelihood that the courts will strike down the tailoring rule. Then we have also the lack of economic analysis from the EPA, which is, 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 is stunning that we uh, do not have a better sense in terms of what the economic impact of these regulations will be. And then finally, and certainly above all else, is the undisputed fact that climate policy should be written here in Congress. It's not just Lisa Murkowski that says that. Uh, it's not just the other 40 senators that have signed on as co-sponsors to this resolution of disapproval. It is everyone from, from the president to the administrator of EPA uh, to, to, to colleagues on the, on the House side have said time and time and time again, it should be the Congress, it should be those of us that are elected members of, of this body, it should be up to us to set the policy of this country, not to unelected bureaucrats within an agency. Now, I'd like to speak to each of these, these four factors in, in a little greater detail. So we'll start by examining why the Clean Air Act is such an awful choice for reducing these emissions. And I, I've explained this many times before, so I'll, I'll reiterate two main points here. First is the way that these regulations are, are carried out. You've got command and control directives that are issued by the government that affect every aspect of our lives rather than market-based decisions made by consumers and, and businesses. And I, I want to I reinforce that, the fact that these are, these are directives that will impact every aspect of our lives. When we were here on this floor not too many months ago debating health care reform, it was repeated time and time again that it's so important that we get this right because health care reform will impact one-sixth of our economy. Well, I would suggest to you that when we are talking about, about climate uh, policy, that is something that is going to impact every aspect, 100 percent of our economy. Uh, the, the system imposed by the EPA will entail millions of permit decisions, millions of permit decisions by mid-level EPA employees without effective recourse, and it will leave regulated entities with very, very little flexibility to comply. Now, another reason why um, the Clean Air Act is, is just extremely complicated for, for reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions the Clean Air Act's explicit regulatory thresholds, they, they, they absolutely put an exclamation mark on why this law 
is such a poor choice for addressing climate change. Under the Act, under the Clean Air Act, if you emit more than 100 or 250 tons of a pollutant each year, you must require or you must acquire uh, a federal air permit. And these relatively low limits make sense for conventional air pollutants that are emitted in, in small quantities, but they become wildly problematic when dealing with a substance that are emitted in huge volumes through nearly every form of commerce, as carbon dioxide is. So the, the question needs to be asked then, how big is this new regulatory act that we're talking about here? The EPA recently projected that some 6.1 million sources could be required to obtain new Title V operating permits. Now, currently, what the EPA is dealing with is about 15,000 under the current regulations. So the EPA would now be charged with moving from regulating and issuing about 15,000 Title V operating permits, moving up, dramatically moving up, to some 6.1 million permits. So who does this include? It would include millions of residential buildings. You've got small businesses, you've got schools, you've got hospitals, you've got restaurants found in every town in America. And over time, the EPA's approach would increase their regulation by an order of magnitude, and, and the consequences would be just as enormous. Now, no one is more aware of this very uncomfortable fact than the EPA itself. They know they can't go from 15,000 permits that they deal with on an annual basis to 6.1 million, million sources. And that's why the agency has attempted to very dramatically increase the threshold for greenhouse gases in its tailoring rule. They're unhappy with the plain language, the very direct language of the Clean Air Act. The agency plans to lift its limits up to 1,000 times higher than Congress has directed. So what you have here is a situation where the EPA has just simply not accepted that the Act, the Clean Air Act, is, is not structured for this task. And instead, they have attempted to make it so by, by ignoring the plain language, the plain language that says you've got to regulate at 100 or 250 uh, tons per year. And they're effectively unilaterally amending the Clean Air Act. And equally astounding is that by temporarily relieving part of a permitting burden, the EPA is claiming that consumers and businesses, the people who purchase and the people who use the energy, will face no economic impact, which is in incredible to believe. I, I asked my colleagues, think about the logic behind the tailoring rule. The EPA is asking us to accept that while greenhouse gases are not in the Clean Air Act, the Congress clearly intended them to be regulated under it. And at the same time, we're expected to believe that while explicit regulatory thresholds are in the Act, Congress meant for the EPA to ignore them. Well, Madam President, I would suggest to you that that's a pretty thin read. And it becomes even thinner when you consider the changes that uh, are made between the tailoring rule that was proposed just last year and then the final rulemaking that was issued just last month. In last year's draft, what you saw was the EPA planning to ratchet down uh, to the Clean Air Act's actual threshold level, so to get down to the, the 250 uh, tons per year, and, and to, to put this into effect over the course of the next five years. But now, the EPA is suggesting that it may exempt entire sectors and never even reach the statutory limits. But think about it. What happens then? That's when the lawsuits pop up. This, this, is, not going to, um, uh, this is not going to provide the level of certainty that I think those in business uh, are, are seeking. Um, what, what you will see is, is lawsuits as some sectors and some sources are regulated 
while others are not. And uh, I, I would suggest that the changes or the, the, the difference between the tailoring proposal from last year and where we are now, these changes are, are driven not by the law, but by fear of the political backlash out there. The, the, the outrage from people all over the country in terms of the economic impact, the negative Im economic impact pack to them and their families and their communities. And that's why it's tough to find an impartial legal expert who believes that this tailoring rule will actually hold up in court. Consider a speech given last year by uh, Judge David Tatel of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, this was a speech on how the EPA can avoid being sued over its rulemakings. And Judge Tatel's remarks um, were this. He said, quote, whether or not agencies value neutral principles of administrative law, courts do. And they will strike down agency action that violates those principles. Whatever the president's party, however popular the administration, and no matter how advisable the initiative. That was, uh, those were the comments from a D.C. Circuit judge specifically on this issue as to how the EPA avoids uh, lawsuits. Now, let me move to the third area of concern that I have with, with EPA moving uh, to regulate in the area of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The economic consequences of EPA regulation. And we have to ask the question, what exactly are those consequences? But believe it or not, at this point in time, we still do not know. Because the EPA has refused to provide projections of the economic impacts. Now, in, in the various rulemakings out there, the agency has engaged in something of a shell game. They're either hiding or they're simply not considering the economic cost. The EPA has also ignored requests from members of Congress. I have asked, other members of Congress have asked, ask them to conduct this very important analysis. But to this day, the agency still has not provided anything close to a full projection of the economic impacts that its economy-wide climate regulations will have. And I guess there's a couple reasons why. The EPA, e EPA either has no cost estimates or they know that they are too astronomical to calculate and they don't want them released. Now, my staff has, has had numerous briefings with EPA officials and they've been told, essentially, that we won't know how much these regulations cost until the best available control technology, technologies are imposed on the regulated entities. And that is, until the EPA figures out how to deal with what it signed itself up for. And the problem is, is that the best available control technologies remains completely undefined at this point. It could mean efficiency improvements, expensive add-on technologies, or even fuel switching requirements. And over time, the EPA would have very little choice but to impose all of those requirements and more, regardless of the consequences. Uh, again, Madam President, it's not hard to find this, this really quite amazing and alarming. We need to be growing our economy, not paralyzing it. Everything that we do right now within this body should be focused on how we grow our economy, how we grow the jobs from Maine to Alaska and points in between. We know national unemployment rate remains at almost 10 percent. Private sector job growth is anemic. And yet, as millions of Americans are doing everything that they can just to find work, Bureaucrats here in Washington, D.C. are contemplating reg regulations that would destroy these opportunities. And we're still, the people of our states have no voice in this bureaucratic process. They are on the verge of being subjected to rules, subjected to regulations that will directly impact their lives, their livelihoods, their, their economic opportunities without ever having an opportunity to express their concerns 
through re their representatives here in Congress. And that brings me to, to my final point here. Politically accountable members of the House and the Senate, not unelected bureaucrats, must develop our nation's energy and climate policies. It is as direct as that. And those policies must be able to pass on their own merits instead of serving as a defense against ill-considered regulations. Now, I, I have said this before, but it bears repeating. Congress will not pass, should not pass, bad legislation in order to stave off bad regulations. And we are neither incapable nor unwilling to legislate on energy and environmental policy. We've demonstrated this in the past. We did this with landmark environmental legislation like the, uh, the, like the Clean Air Act, uh, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act. We can, we can, we should and we will uh, deal with these, these environmental challenges that face us. But foregoing legislation in favor of regulation would sacrifice the priorities and the protections that are sought by just about every member of the Senate here. The things that, that are, are being considered when we talk about uh, uh, climate legislation, a worker training, funding for clean technologies, energy security enhancements, border adjustments, manufacturing concessions, these, could, these would all go by the wayside if, if climate policy is directed through regulation as opposed to legislation. There will be no agricultural offsets, no free allowances, no banking, no borrowing under the Clean Air Act. There will be no funding for climate research or adaptation no protection for consumers, and no assistance for businesses or workers. Now, I, I do understand that, that some members say that they will only support climate legislation that puts a price on emissions. Um, they're frustrated that we here in the Senate haven't done that, haven't agreed to do that yet. But I don't believe that mandating higher energy costs and imposing regulations on consumers and businesses is the only way to solve this challenge. Now, some, some have likened the, the, EPA, um, uh, the EPA regulation as, as the gun to the head of, of Congress that will force us somehow to act more quickly on climate legislation than we otherwise would. I think, sadly, a few of the members of, of the Senate have actually bought into this, this coercive strategy. But, Madam President, throughout the year-long debate on this issue, and it has been just about a year, it was last September that uh, I attempted to introduce legislation that would uh, put the EPA in a one-year timeout. I wasn't allowed to bring uh, that measure to the floor. But throughout this year-long debate on the issue, opponents have refused to discuss the actual impacts of EPA regulation. So I want you to listen today. Listen to the debate. See if any opponents actually defend such regulation as being good for America. Instead, you're going to hear some red hearings about science, about fuel standards, about the oil spill. But as much as some would want it to be, this debate is not about the science of climate change. It's not a referendum on any other legislation that is pending in the science Senate, and nor is it about fuel efficiency. The Department of Transportation is and has been in charge for 35 years now, and we don't need another agency and another standard thrown into the mix to do the same job. We updated our nation's CAFE standards less than three years ago uh, to at least 35 miles per gallon, and we left DOT in charge of their administration. And we also outlined a very rational process for standards for medium and heavy-duty trucks. And every target, every target set by this administration can be met with existing authorities. And as the Department of Transportation has admitted, our resolution does not directly impact their ability to regulate the efficiency and thus the greenhouse gas emissions of motor vehicles. There, there is one very small uh, potential exception, and that's air conditioning. But I have very little doubt 
that we would gladly provide EPA with a specific authority to regulate those systems instead of broad powers over our entire economy. The EPA does not need to take over this process, and it should not be allowed to do so under a law that was never intended to regulate fuel economy. I understand concerns about a patchwork of standards and how difficult that would be for the industry to comply with it. But while we had one national standard at the start of 2009, we now have two national standards set by two federal agencies driven by California's standards. And I've got a, a letter here from the National Automobile Dealers Association dated uh, just yesterday that spells this out really quite clearly. And, and they indicate that it, is, it in no way helps us to have, again, two national standards set by two federal agencies. The best way, the best way to avoid a messy patchwork would be to pass our disapproval resolution, revoke California's waiver, allow one federal agency to set one standard that works for all 50 states. Bringing climate science, the oil spill, and fuel economy into this debate are attempts at misdirection. They are red herrings that are intended to convince members to oppose the resolution of disapproval. But this debate has nothing to do about those topics. It's about finding the best approach to reduce emissions and defending against policies that fail to strike an adequate balance between the environment and our economy. It's about maintaining the separation of powers between the legislative and the executive branches as our fa founding fathers intended and rejecting, rejecting an unprecedented overreach by the EPA into the affairs of Congress. And at its core, this is a debate about jobs, about whether we should seek conditions that will lead to their creation or enable policies that will destroy them. This is our chance to make sure that federal bureaucrats do not place a new burden on millions of hardworking Americans at a time that they cannot afford and in a way that they cannot reject. The time has come, Madam President, to take the worst option for regulating greenhouse gases off the table once and for all. Under the procedures of the Congressional Review Act, I accordingly move to proceed to consideration of Senate Joint Resolution 26. I encourage members of this chamber to support debate on this measure and to vote in favor of both the motion to proceed and final passage. Madam President, I know that under the unanimous consent agreement uh, this morning and throughout the day, it is 30 minutes uh, um, per side and I'm not certain how much time I have consumed this morning, if you can instruct. The Senator has two minutes remaining. Well, Madam President, I know that uh, Senator Lincoln was hoping uh, to, to come over uh, this morning, and what I will do at this point in time, if I may reserve those two minutes, uh, and uh, seeing that Senator Lincoln is not yet here, uh, we can move to, uh, to the Democratic side of the aisle if, if Senator Boxer is ready to, to proceed. Without objection. Senator from The motion having been made under the previous order, there will now be up to five and a half hours of debate.